Okay. A warm welcome to all of you. Today's speaker is Reverend Dr. Alan Samuel Palenna. He is in the faculty of United Theological College, Bengaluru. He is also known as an environmentalist. It is a privilege for me to welcome you, sir, to this program. Over to Alan Palenna. Thank you very much, uh, dear Dr. Matthew Koshi. Uh, dear sisters, brothers, pastors, uh, friends, uh, please allow me to thank uh, and express my deep felt gratitude to dear Professor Dr. Matthew Koshi for his invitation, for his love, for his hospitality, for, for allowing uh, all of us to come together, most importantly, and heading this uh, movement within the Church of South India is given um, uh, leadership uh, to the ecological concerns department uh, through the years and uh, we are certainly privileged that uh, professor dr matthew koshi heads this uh, department thank you very much uh, dr koshi for your continuing uh, uh, leadership as well as guidance dear uh, friends uh, throughout the these uh, lectures uh, I'm sure that this has been most enlightening because uh, when I saw many of these uh, lectures, it is certainly useful that you actually brought together biblical and theological perspectives and, and saw how this relates uh, to our very lives and church lives and our ministerial lives. And therefore, um, before I begin um, uh, this uh, session, uh, uh, I would really request any of you, if you do have any preliminary questions, to please ask, uh, so that uh, we will certainly incorporate that during this uh, lecture. Not that we have a precise set lecture, yes we do, uh, but having said so, uh, if you have any concerns, something that is there at the back of your mind that you wanted to ask which you hadn't until now, uh, and you still wish to address that in some way or the other, uh, please do uh, choose to uh, share this uh, now. Uh, you, can, uh, you can either unmute yourself and speak, or you can always use the chat box um, if you do have any preliminary questions. So we take the preliminary questions that are uh, right at the beginning, and then we'll go uh, to the actual process, and that is the lecture, and the topic that is given for us uh, today uh, by the department is um, climate justice and green movements. Um, uh, both these concepts might um, appear familiar to many of us or certainly not. And therefore we'll try uh, as much to unpack this uh, through the course of this, uh, this lecture, this talk, the seminar, webinar, and, and try and sense uh, how can we converse with this or, or, or try and sense uh, whether all our conversations can be brought together. So in the first half, uh, I, would, uh, I would certainly invite um, uh, any of you or all of you to share any concerns or any questions or any clarifications, uh, something that is preliminary to begin with. So we have about uh, uh, just generally uh, 60 of us, including all of us. So um, I would certainly request if you do have uh, anything to share that we, uh, that we can actually bring that into uh, this conversation that we may have. Okay, I sense that uh, not many um, uh, would like to ask. Even if you have anything to say or um, uh, anything to share, please do not hesitate um, uh, to, uh, to intervene in any point during this conversation because it's a conversation and that is why please do feel free to, uh, uh, to put that in a chat box. So think about it during, uh, yes, thank you very much uh, uh, for, for, for this chat that you said. So uh, in any case, if you do have anything, uh, please do um, uh, please do intervene at any point um, using the chat box, or simply unmute yourself, and then um, uh, then uh, please do ask. 
So um, I'll try and share the uh, screen with us so that um, uh, we will bring all our thoughts together uh, and then uh, we'll see. Okay, there is a question, uh, there's a preliminary question that I can see uh, from uh, Reverend uh, Sanjeev Raj. I can, I can read it for all of us. Uh, Reverend Sanjeev Raj asks, what is climate justice in the biblical perspective? and in Jesus' teaching in the Gospels. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Diaya, for that. Um, uh, it's certainly a large topic, and uh, what has uh, been uh, done through these uh, lectures, earlier lectures, um, is that um, uh, many of these lectures have certainly um, uh, tried to uh, answer to this very question. This is a very important question, a very crucial question. I would say the most fundamental question uh, in our um, uh, in our approach that uh, what can be justice according to the Bible? What is what uh, what is uh, justice according to be uh, Jesus' teaching, especially bringing uh, the climate? So. Um, uh, I would certainly um, uh, not uh, wade into some of the most uh, uh, crucial examples that my colleagues have given earlier. I might certainly repeat what they have said, which is important, uh, because uh, justice is a process in the Bible, which culminates in how uh, God, God brings the world to God's self. Uh, justice is not simply one issue. There is no issueizing justice. We say justice issues. So when we say justice issue, we try and put that as one small category of all the very many categories. But, um, but in the Bible, in Jesus' teaching, especially in the Gospels, at, at least as I understand uh, with my limited understanding, uh, justice is the bedrock of who God is and what God does. So, um, as the early theologians and um, uh, scholars and uh, um, uh, biblical thinkers would say uh, that we know who God is by what God does. We know who God is by what God does. And that's why what God does in the, in the Bible and um, especially in the Gospels through Jesus Christ is God does justice, especially to the climate. And uh, there are various ways with which we can understand that. And that's how we know who God is. God is uh, one who encompasses the entire creation. And then, uh, as one theologian would say, God may have shrunk God's self so that creation might come into existence. Because God encompasses the entire cosmos. And so, if the world had to come into being, God must have shrunk God's self so that there is a space for another thing to emerge, all of us. And that's why that is what God, God's justice looks like. God's justice uh, is incarnational in the sense that God enfleshes, God, God, God is seen through, um, uh, through God's manifestation in and through Jesus Christ. Sorry for the, for the uh, longish uh, explanation to the precise question that uh, Reverend Sanjeev Raj raised. Uh, but I thank uh, Reverend Sanjeev Raj for this preliminary question. So if, uh, if there are any uh, such questions, uh, please, uh, please let it come and uh, we'll try and uh, converse with it. I'll try and share the screen with all of us so that uh, we have a perspective as we begin uh, so that uh, we are through with this. Please do let me know if the uh, screen does come up or uh, if there is any, um, any hindrance in your viewing the screen so that I'll try and redo that again. Um, I hope it's visible, uh, dear friends. Sisters and brothers, children, if there are any, uh, is the screen visible? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the theme that is suggested for us uh, is uh, ju uh, climate justice and green uh, movements. Okay, I do have a chat. Thank you. Thank you very much for that confirmation. Um, what we are, uh, we, what, what is the theme that we are looking at is, if we were to argue, is fundamental to the way in which our theory, our understanding of the environment 
comes into praxis, a practice, what we call praxis. This is where it hits the road. This is where it hits the ground. Uh, without involvement, there is no justice. And that is why we sense that this is the most important, crucial, fundamental, the fulcrum, the foundation with which we we exist as um, as ecological beings. If not, if not, it simply remains in theory. It simply remains in our understanding. It simply remains as something in the air and doesn't. Um, uh, come to the ground and that is the problem that we find as to why this particular crisis is at hand and, and, and that's why we we sense this movement uh, towards um, uh, towards these preliminary questions that we will ask ourselves uh, can someone read the first question please in the group How oh, worried are we about the present and the future of the earth? Thank you. This is very simple. This is straightforward. We have been asking this question throughout these uh, lectures as we see. Are we really worried? Or um, is it just uh, someone is saying that something is wrong with the earth, with the environment? And uh, we know about that, of course we know about that. But are we truly worried? Does it worry us? Does it give us sleepless nights? If it doesn't, then that means that um, we have been saturated. You know the word saturated? That we have come to an understanding, yes, this is an another, another thing that, uh, that is being said. And so uh, and we can manage this. And that's why if you are not really worried, worry is something that might give us sleepless nights, as I said. Something that, uh, that will not allow us to live properly. Okay, that is worry. So if you are worrying about very many things, but are not certainly worrying about this, uh, the present, that is for us. And also for those uh, who are to come, the children that we, uh, that we have uh, around us, and um, and the future generation can someone else read the second one please what is the future of eco justice in one's perspective drains and states regions oh. and states thank you thank you very much uh, so uh, the first one um, leads to the second one what is the present or the future of eco justice what actually is eco justice do we need it um, isn't ecology enough? Why we actually bring forth another word called eco-justice? That is what we are asking. The question that has come on our, um, uh, popped up on our, uh, on our screen uh, through Reverend uh, M. Laza, who asked, green movements, politics, or really service? Then what is, uh, what is the relevance of the Jesus movement? Is it only about politics or service? And how is the Jesus movement related to any form of green movement? Thank you very much, Reverend Lazar. Uh, we, uh, in the second half of the lecture, we'll try and address this important question that you have posed to all of us. Uh, wh what is the significance? How is um, uh, the way in which we understand G the Jesus movement, wherein which um, uh, the most vulnerable communities, the most subaltern communities, not the dominant communities, but the most uh, despised communities uh, become uh, participants of the Jesus movement. And is, is the same movement visible in the green movement is what we, we would test today. Can we find a comparison between the Jesus movement as we saw in first century Israel and the movements that we find in terms of ecological movements in the 21st century, in our century. Do we find parallels? What are the parallels? Uh, why should we actually strike that parallel between the first century Jesus movement and ecological movements, green movements, where people participate in conserving nature, in, uh, in, in highlighting the dangers, the crisis of the earth, 
are there ca ca parallels is what Reverend Laza would wish to uh, hopefully wish to ask if not uh, Reverend Laza might certainly clarify uh, you're most welcome Reverend Laza when we come to the second part, um, no, second part of the lecture so uh, these two questions are important for us as we understand how uh, we uh, we put things in perspective I, I always put this up uh, for all of us that many of you are pastors here and I'm glad that we are all colleagues here and um, uh, we have always studied uh, um, when we have uh, sensed uh, the uh, the New Testament concept of the house what we call oikos oikos means a household um, in the Bible and oikos is the same word that we um, that actually finds echoes reverberations in all these three words you know when you say economics it's a secular word now but if you look at it it comes uh, the first part is oikos you see eco ecology and ecumenism all these have a part within the same word called oikos they all emerge from this very word called oikos which means household so what does that mean for us that these three words are interrelated how is it interrelated economics may be understood as the management of uh, households financial resources household doesn't simply mean our little house household also means an enlarged space a space that can encompass the earth itself so economics is a way of managing that ecumenism is a way of managing our spiritual moral and um, our ethical means of how we actually perceive the world how we look at the world in what uh, in what ways do we actually understand our world it is through the way in which our morals, our ethics, uh, our spirituality is conditioned, is shaped, is molded and that is what we can sense. Ecology certainly is sometimes seen as the management of the household's physical resources. The one word that we need to be very conscious of is the word resource. Now, when you, um, uh, if you, uh, if you uh, open any um, social studies books of, um, uh, say, let's say, um, uh, of schools, and you open it, and then you, uh, you see the section on, uh, uh, quote and unquote, natural resources of the world. Okay, what do you find? Well, what is written generally? What are the children um, learning um, in the schools? Okay. That all these are natural resources okay, when we say natural resources which means that we have access to it okay. it's basically very many times it's about water it's about uh, metals it's about certain soils it's about all those things that somehow help human beings that are supposed to give human beings um, the right to live and the right to exploit and that's the problem with the word resource, natural resource. And uh, the, the first problem is that it is as if it is a bottomless pit wherein which we can take as much as we want. A resource simply means something that is not finishable, you know, it, which, which cannot be finished, it, which goes forever and ever. Resource, you know, resourcing which is not the case as we see now the so-called natural resource has its limits which means that it cannot go forever and when we are consciously forever using the word natural resources we are duping ourselves by by actually putting a limitlessness to the earth a limitlessness to what the earth has so that um, so that there is uh, we can go on forever which is not the case the earth has its limits uh, what is inside within the earth has its limits and how do we know that 
I'll give consciously examples within the global south as to what is happening. Uh, it's important to look at um, uh, other uh, countries that are around us, especially in the global south, um, as to uh, what is happening. Um, uh, I am just lo checking the chat as well. I just saw the chat. Thank you. Good evening to you. Um, uh, so when we, um, when we sense this, um, let's take uh, the example of uh, Zimbabwe and the ecological crisis there. Um, this is um, uh, from a 2014 review. It's almost uh, very many years that has happened. But one natural disaster that I, I wish to point out, I'll try and uh, I'll try and try and underline that uh, right here. If I have the, uh, just give me a moment. Uh, I'll just uh, use the highlighter to highlight some of the points that are there. Uh, uh, there was what we call a Kobe uh, Mukorsi disaster. It did not um, it did not get uh, much headline uh, around the world. It, none of the global southern news makes uh, headlines around the world. But this is important uh, because uh, what we are looking at is there is uh, a, a clear divide between, as you see, um, I'll try, I'm trying to simplify things. Um, uh, please uh, uh, consciously stop me at any point uh, where if, if it becomes uh, more monotonous or uh, in some way that um, is not uh, that is not being communicated so please let me know about that in any time uh, what we are looking at is there is a clear divide between the global north and the global south and within the global south we are to be aware as to what is happening around the global south because it has implications to how we live our lives right here and uh, many of us uh, certainly a part uh, of the global south, or all of us. So what is happening um, in Zimbabwe is what is happening across, including India. And that is why I give uh, these relevant examples. And so um, uh, this is the Kobe Mukosi Dam, and you can read about this as to what happened. And since there is no time, I will not specify on each of these cases as to what is happening and continues to happen across the world, which, as I said earlier, does not make any headlines. Why should it? Because um, um, it's about people who are vulnerable, who are marginalized, and, um, and these news are not, quote and unquote, newsworthy. It's not newsworthy, and that's why it's not reported across the world. But the devastation that it is causing uh, to the people around is um, unimaginable. And what is happening in this dam has repercussions, has implications, has an implication to all of us living elsewhere. When you look at Zambia and the ecological crisis, we find that the Kabwe uh, mining sites have um, very many times uh, higher um, uh, cases uh, of uh, lead levels, as we see. Uh, and uh, and fatal to to children. This is just a small case, and this is being replicated, which means that it is happening all across the global south, and certainly the global north uh, will get affected one way or the other. Uh, uh, why we are saying that is that we need to test at some point even our children's blood levels. Today, we find today that even if we uh, test our own blood, I am not trying to fear monger here, I am not trying to um, uh, create a fear psychosis uh, around us, but I am just trying to sense how it has come to um, affect even our own lives, including our own individual lives. So if you are, um, uh, the recent studies have indicated that if you are looking uh, or if you are sensing um, uh, our own blood levels, you find the presence of microplastics within our blood streams. Microplastics have entered our blood streams. And if that is the case, and that is why um, certainly it is not maybe one of the causes of a lot of um, heart ailments, because clogging our, um, our, um, our, our uh, artery systems. 
and um, and therefore um, uh, we we find that uh, that is exactly what it is the Quabbe mining site. So if you, I, I'm deliberately avoiding some of the mining sites that we have, you can sense what it is to live uh, in and around it. And then uh, we go to Madagascar and um, how the slash and burn agriculture um, has increased there. This is from the mayor's report of 2000. It has increased certainly. And if you look at the depleting uh, forest cover of Madagascar itself, you would see what happens when we come to 2089 or lesser or earlier. I, I'm deliberately taking uh, the less known countries that we are looking at. And uh, once I just wrote um, uh, the word Tuvalu on the class board and asked the students to tell me what it meant. Tuvalu, T-U-V-A-L-U, Tuvalu. I, I'm not. Uh, I won't embarrass you and ask you what it means. Um, some said it is a towel. You know, tal. Is that Tuvalu? Is that towel? Uh, some said it might be an animal. Some said uh, various other things. Uh, but few guess that uh, it is actually a country. I haven't heard of the country. Some of you have may have heard about that country. It is a country in the world map. We hear about dominant countries, big countries, always on the news, but we don't necessarily hear about countries which are constantly sinking because of the rising sea levels. Tuvalu is a country in the Pacific, and in a few years' time, Tuvalu will be non-existent because Tuvalu will be underwater, underwater because the because of the constant rise of the sea levels. Many of the islands across uh, around India are actually sinking into the sea. Not many of us know this. A few islands of Bangladesh actually sank into the sea very recently. You can check the news for that. It did not make it into the news because it's not newsworthy. But it is important that constantly if the sea levels are rising, one country after the other will certainly sink. I'm not giving you, a, um, again, a worst case scenario, but it is actually true. When you come to, the, uh, come to India, we would sense, we'll start from the capital. Okay? Uh, nearly 19% or more school children suffer from asthma in Delhi, as you know. Uh, what was the smog? Smog means um, uh, a mixture of fog and smoke, which was generally uh, during the winter season in Delhi, has now come directly uh, to even in the summer. Uh, we are not speaking about the Ganga at all, the most sacred river. I'm just giving you certain highlights of this. And uh, uh, this is a theologian called uh, C.S. Song. And I want uh, ask one of you to please read the quote. I, I generally quote this in class as well. So um, uh, please... Uh, uh, please feel free to read this, if uh, a volunteer can please read this. As far as I can see, Christian universities and churches in Asia, old and new, are standing on the crossroads, carrying business as usual with no viable alternatives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. um, it's a reminder for all of us that uh, uh, that CS song is saying that we are carrying business as usual which means that um, uh, though everything is going haywire around us uh, we have somehow uh, chosen a safer path something that has insulated us covered us all across that we are carrying as um, as a CS song says business as usual and providing absolutely no viable alternatives. It's about theological colleges because um, um, Song presidency says Christian universities. It's about theological academies, churches within our own places. We are not able to um, conceive. But thanks to the Department of Ecological Concerns, at least in the Church of South India and some other churches, well, the Church of South India 
uh, has always been inspiring not that i belong to the church of south india the karnataka southern diocese that i say this um uh, but most importantly uh, we are certainly glad and thankful to god for providing us this department to actually uh, perceive the ecological crisis as, uh, as something that um, hits our lives um, and uh, how we can respond as churches as local communities in this endeavor and so we need to constantly listening to um, uh, the prophets of our times to actually sense what exactly is happening so when we look at um, ecological injustice we need to understand this as that there is a false understanding is a false understanding that somehow we are immune that we are protected from climate change and nothing nothing will happen to us the past two years of the pandemic has um, have, have actually taught us a lesson a lesson that human beings are not always in control not possible um there are things that are uh, that uh, we do not know yet as to what how it will unfold in front of us and when only when it unfolds do we realize our own limitedness our limits of human understanding the way in which we can respond to a crisis is what our limits but there is a false understanding somehow that we can manage manage climate change and that's why the lackluster response especially in the higher levels of government or in the uh, in the local communities because we can somehow manage we have been managing all through these years and uh, we hear about the ecological crisis yes uh but uh, something might come up our technology is great and so we can somehow overcome it it's not the case as we said the last two years have given a clear indication that human beings are not always in control and uh, the far more dangerous thing that we can see about um, uh, ecological injustice is this that there is a danger of familiarity now in english we say familiarity breeds contempt for us it it also breeds a certain sense of lethargy or laziness uh, or in fact carelessness carelessness that we get so used to a topic that we don't sense it as a, as a crisis now i always give the example that when we walk on um, uh, on a uh, on a bit of grass okay every time maybe a grass lawn or or something like that and then when we walk for a long time it becomes so hardened the ground becomes so hardened that nothing grows there nothing grows there that is what is happening to the understanding of ecology also because we are so we are so used to it that um, that all these lectures which which are to be helpful certainly so will make us so familiar that that we may not sense it as a crisis we may not sense it as something that is real something that will hit us any time something that will uh, push uh, our children as well as the future into a point of no return into a point of no return and that is why we need to overcome this false understanding that's number 1 number 2 we need to be aware that anything familiar will become problematic to to how we actually understand ecological injustice and so uh, very quickly for, for those who are interested in this i'm not insisting that all should be interested in but just to give a very quick uh, uh, overview of uh, of uh, some of the significant contributions that have helped us to actually sense that there is a problem in how we understand our own faith in terms of ecology how do we understand our own faith very quickly i'll run through it um, it's exactly 9 1 as we see we have less than half an hour possibility for this for this uh, for this talk for this conversation and so i'll try and hurry things up from now on just give you an indication of, of some of the works that have helped for those in the academy would um, would certainly be 
perhaps be benefited from this. Um, uh, that in 1949, um, Aldo Leopold's um, uh, wonderful uh, offering, a Sand County Almanac, and sketches here and there, uh, uh, at least in recent memory, gave what had happened just uh, just across after the Second World War of what would happen to the Earth from now on. That was nine. And in 1962, uh, Rachel uh, Carson's book Silent Spring was another significant moment where in which uh, Rachel Carson actually uh, sought to see what had happened. Okay, I'm just checking the chat as well just to see whether there is uh, anything there. And then uh, when we go further, uh, we, 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 we sense um, uh, a few works. Uh, this was a small uh, article that, uh, that came in, um, in the journal Science okay, in 1968, Gareth Hardin, who actually looked at how the commons, anything that we hold as common, for instance, water um, and air, these are uh, common holdings, be would become highly privatized, would, uh, would, would actually become uh, so privatized that uh, even possibly the air in the future may become metered, you know, just as how we have metered water and other, uh, other um, uh, natural means, even air might be subjected to a particular rationing because of the, uh, we, uh, we are not, as I said, dreading uh, a worst case scenario. That's why these are important because if we, uh, if we pass a particular point, as I said, um, uh, there is, that is the point of no return. And before that, we need to uh, sense what the others had warned us much, much, much earlier. We began in, just began in 1949. We have other sources who have been warning us earlier as well. And so, um, and what we need to understand is that the environmental crisis is not simply economic or technological. We, uh, we look at the environmental crisis as air pollution, noise pollution, etc., etc. That's, that's how we perceive it. And it's right to do so, certainly right to do so. But what we try and do is that we look at it as a product of science, as a product of a bad technology, as a product of, a, of our human intervention, which is correct, which is wrong. But much more than that, we need to understand that basically ecological injustice is a moral injustice. A spiritual injustice and if we do not connect that we would sense it or put that okay elsewhere and say that someone else is doing some industry is doing that or uh, some other big uh, manufacturing company is doing that which is correct no doubt about that we need to hold them accountable as a moral and a spiritual crisis at hand and what we have uh, what we are looking at is that um, there is um, there is an evacuation as we say of divine meaning what is this evacuation of divine meaning when we uh, take away divinity out of anything it becomes non-existent I'll try and uh, explain this particular uh, particular way of looking at it uh, if uh, when we were children, uh, many of you might remember. Um, uh, let's consider this. Let's say this this book for that matter. Okay. So um, uh, when the book would drop, or if we uh, if our leg would have touched the book, we would we would actually take the book and uh, somehow ask forgiveness or something like that and keep that. Okay. Because we associated divinity, a small sense of spirituality to a thing. We know that the book may be non-existent, but yet if our, if our feet touched the book or uh, if the book fell, we would actually pick it up and, uh, and give a sense that we respect that particular book. Why we would do that? We associated a sense of spirituality to that. So when you take away that spirituality, it becomes it becomes a thing, it becomes lifeless. 
and that is what has happened to the environment as well around us ecological injustice begins as a spiritual injustice as a moral injustice because we have not associated divinity to um to the environment around us which certainly our four parents did as we see they associated a sense of divinity to um to these and now since it has become simply objects and when anything becomes a object it can be thrown it can be done away with it can be used misused and abused because we have evacuated divine meaning out of that and um, and that's why we need to understand this this deep sense of disenchantment with nature how we have uh, looked at nature as lifeless and so uh, cs lewis has uh, has said so beautifully uh, can someone please read it for us yeah go ahead please unmute and... the stars lost their divinity as astronomy developed and the dying god has no place in chemical agriculture thank you um uh, cs lewis um, a great think um, uh, a great spiritual um, uh, minister reflected on what was happening around and and said that um, uh, when our own understanding came to not saying that uh, uh, science is problematic but we also say that science is not value free the ones who actually do science come with a certain sense of value system it's about how a value system pervades our thinking um, uh, permeates into our thinking reflects our thinking and this is what cs lewis says and um, as you know this uh, wonderful uh, critique of christianity uh, that some of christianity was also responsible for the ecological injustice is what lynn white says and this particular article is well known someone or anyone would have certainly uh, indicated uh, possibly in in many of the lectures um and lynn white's article uh, the historical roots of the ecological crisis where in which uh, um lynn white directly suggests that somehow christianity and judaism are human centered you uh, human beings as the center of creation and that's why some of christian theology is responsible for ecological injustice the environmental crisis and that's why we need to reflect on our own thinking and um, uh, the uh, the first question that uh, if we remember i mean uh, sanjeev uh, did ask us was exactly this how do we actually reflect on our own um, uh, on our own faith especially based upon our biblical understanding as to how we can sense and that's why there are few pointers that i would like to place before ourselves as a conversation the first one is um, the ecological issue is not simply and quote and quote an environmental issue but a justice issue there is a difference when you simply see it or when we simply see it as an environmental issue we actually say that we can actually manage that um uh, we uh, we say that okay we can do this we can do that we can intervene and then it becomes an issue but justice is something greater justice he hap uh, comes to a conversation when there is actual injustice against a against a, a particular entity and in this case it is the environment and uh, if it is a justice issue then then what happens is that someone will be the accused you know we are speaking in legal terms now someone will be the accused and who's the accused human beings stand as the accused not simply human beings one group of human beings let us consider that one group of human beings who control uh, vast um, fortunes of the earth are guilty and that's why we are bringing uh, we are bringing this aspect of justice as a legal issue not simply as uh, something that can and another shift that we need to make is uh, our um, our uh, discourses about climate change we need to move towards climate justice what's the difference 
climate change again is academic climate change is something that is data based and then we can simply view it as that uh, we will not sense it that something is to be done and that is where climate justice we need to we need to shift our discourse from climate change to climate justice we need to shift our discourse from uh, sustainable quote and unquote sustainable development to sustainable life sustainable development is a good uh, concept but we need to know that it's a dominant concept coming from um, uh, from a group that stands to um, that stands to gain from such a concept because development is not sustainable and uh, this particular word um this particular concept is a brilliant concept that has been uh, that has been given to us and it actually masks it hides the environmental crisis because uh, we can do any development and it can be sustainable sustainable development can be seen as an oxymoron which means that two conflicting words brought together and that's why we need to move away from uh, any forms of uh, Uh, sustainable development though it ha- may have prospects no doubt about that but we need to move towards sustainable uh, we need to also move our discourse from uh, uh, stewardship to possibly kinship and partnership stewardship has its has its essence there's no doubt about that it has biblical roots uh, we uh, we are truly grateful uh, to all the um, all the thinking that has happened in in terms of stewardship but um, Uh, but uh, critics have pointed out that uh, w- even within stewardship there is a sense of hierarchy there is a sense of hierarchy that somehow we can care for we can manage uh, we can uh, we can t- we can actually o- oversee so there is a sense of hierarchy in this world uh, and we need to move uh, possibly away i'm not saying that we should Uh, this is part of a conversation that whether it's a time is there to actually think of kinship where there is a bond a blood bond um uh, between uh, between us and creation though though not in the uh, not in the literal sense but certainly in a deeper sense partnership and we need to f- possibly further the discourse if we are uh, conscious about ecological injustice if we are conscious about ecological justice we need to further the discourse from mere tree planting to recovering biodiversity there is a difference tree planting is good tree planting is is uh, certainly something that we are to do but um, what the industries are doing is they are actually taking this path for their own gains they are basically saying that give us uh, i'm just um, i'm just trying to highlight uh, this particular difference give us one acre of the forest of this particular forest and then we'll actually uh, plant trees for let's say 100 acres it's a good deal if you think about it for one acre of forest land someone is planting 100 acres of trees which is a good deal what is there for one acre 100 acres um, um, trees can be certainly form uh, for can be got but we can actually bring up an entire forest in say let's say 5 years or 10 years but we cannot replace biodiversity we always say this we cannot replace di- biodiversity for biodiversity to be uh, to come by it takes millions of years with these small cycles environmental cycles that have happened which have contributed to what uh, what we have now that's not possible and that's why um uh, tree planting given that we we actually um we, uh, go further into tree planting no doubt about that but we are to conserve we need to stop ways of um, destroying biodiversity and um finally that's where we begin from we need to sense the perspective from the most vulnerable communities subaltern communities people at the margins who actually speak about just and that's why we need to decenter our epistemology this is the last section of our lecture for today it's just gone past half um, 
quarter past nine, nine fifteen uh, is the time, nine sixteen actually, uh, and that's why we just have a few minutes more, and uh, I'll try and speed that up right at the end. That uh, there is a, a knowledge violence against subaltern communities, uh, which means that one part of the knowledge of ecology has been deliberately stopped. And another part, which is more dominant, which is more stronger, is being given for us in terms of our understanding of the environment so that the world's richest can survive, can continue to plunder the earth. And that's why we need to shift the knowledge system about our ecology. And that's why, we need, firstly, we need to sense that there has been a knowledge violence against the most vulnerable communities. And this knowledge is not simply cerebral knowledge, as we see. It is about a lived experience of the most vulnerable communities. And so all across, we need to sense environmental racism or environmental casteism. And uh, we need to deliberately hear uh, the indigenous voices. And even as I speak, I know that I come from, uh, um, from a point of view of privilege. Privilege as being an ordained um, presbyter, perhaps, in the academia. And even as I say, I, I, I am conscious of this. Uh, with great humility, I come to this uh, sense that uh, what I am trying to do is simply share uh, the knowledge that uh, I have received from, uh, or from the most vulnerable communities that we, we seek to serve. And, um, and uh, I'll try and uh, push this further very quickly. We need to sense that indigenous communities are more likely to live near polluted environments. Always, if you look at any point, of, I saw, I gave you the example of uh, India and elsewhere in the globe, uh, global south, you would find that indigenous people are the most affected. And they're more likely to live and, and the front line of the ecological crisis. We might have our own nicer and safer spaces as of now. I don't know how far it will continue. But someone else is in the front line of the ecological crisis. And we need to critique the dominant ecological consciousness that we often hear. And that is, uh, generally the sources that we choose to articulate ecology come from dominant communities. Let us consider that. Uh, and, uh, and that's why we need to ask this, why is this ecological consciousness in these uh, vulnerable communities not taken into consideration? Why are they consciously avoided all across the world, including India? And that is why, finally, green movements are important. Because a green movements are where in which subaltern communities see sense. And that's why there is a critique of any of these class, caste, gender-based uh, narratives. And it critiques also the NGOization of environmental movements that we see. That people tend to gain from these movements. And that is why we sense that green movements are consciously ecological movements of subaltern communities. I know it's a strict definition that we are giving ourselves, but this is one point that we can take home today. That green movements are those movements that we consciously, precisely identify as movements coming from vulnerable communities, which highlight the environmental crisis. Let's be clear about that. If all the other lecture uh, things that I've said earlier have, have confounded you or um, uh, may have not been very clear, this is something that I would like to emphasize very clearly. That the environmental movements are consciously subaltern movements. So I'll give you examples of that very quickly. The Changara Lang struggle or the Changara Lang struggle, uh, ongoing Changara Lang struggle in Kerala, farmers' protests that we saw in Delhi can also be seen as a movement, Chipko movement, Narmada Bachao, many Dalit, Adivasi, um, tribal, indigenous movements can be seen as these movements. And I can give you various examples of other movements that have happened across the global south in Zambia 
uh, all these networks that you can find um, uh, there is no time to explain every bit of it but it's a fascinating that how people who are ordinary people at the margins as I said people most vulnerable communities how they actually form organic movements you know without any force without anyone they come together to actually sense and lay claim to the rights of the earth and that is what we are looking at so you see the Chengara land struggle the Chipko Andolan and the Narmada Bachao Andolan and that's why finally just um, a few minutes to go um, ethics is uh, the future order of liberation the demands of justice with respect to the poor the oppressed and the project of salvation as um, Dussel the South American theologian would say and that is why our, our, uh, our task today is to sense within our own churches, within our own communities. We need to, um, uh, we need to sense how are the most vulnerable communities responding to the ecological crisis and how we can be participants, not leaders, but participants uh, as allies. A L L Y allies in um, in these movements that are already happening in and around us, and that is why we need to identify what are the movements that are consciously being done in order to protect um, uh, the uh, the rights of the earth and possibly become participants. And that's why green movements, if we say, are counter hegemonic. And it stands for decolonization. When there is a colonization of the earth, as we said, colonization of the life world, as uh, Habermas would say, when that is happening, green movement is counter to that. That which goes against the normal flow. That which goes, which swims against the tide for the rights of the earth. And uh, there are various perspectives for those who are interested. These are the perspectives that are there within generally the uh, green movements. And if we did have time, we could have certainly discussed that, at least the politics of Jal, jungle and Jameen, water, forest and the land, and local struggles for clothing, livelihood. Uh, and these can also be termed as green movements. And Green movements have a sense of an alternative politics, an alternative consciousness, as Brueggemann would say, alternative consciousness, alternative to the consciousness of the dominant world. It is an alternative way of looking at it. And, uh, and, uh, and these are local forms of democracy that, that uh, surpasses all of it. Uh, I'll not read uh, the entire quote of Dayanandan, just one way that we need to be aware that they might be prejudice and elitism. Because prejudice and elitism also lead to pride that adds to the power of the oppressor. We need to be conscious that when we belong or when we participate in any green movement, we should not be prejudiced. That's number one. And we need to avoid, shun, overcome and uh, eradicate and highlight any form of elitism that we might bring to it. And finally, as uh, any Prabhaka says, not only a, pro a prophetic theology, but also a political theology for social action towards transformation of injustice, undemocratic and oppressive structures. And that is the call for our churches today. And um, it's exactly uh, in 925, that was exactly the time that was given uh, to us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Koshi, uh, for this um, opportunity, and I certainly look forward to any conversations now. I thank everyone for your patient uh, listening. If you have any questions, you can write in the chat box or you can ask.
um, as uh, as uh, friends gather uh, their thoughts uh, please do a uh, form any question that you have um, and then start uh, start writing or you can uh, you can please unmute and uh, you can ask uh, what we did say very briefly was that we began if you remember um, as um, climate justice and green movements were our topic was certainly a topic and then we began with preliminary questions about how worried we are and what is the future of eco justice and then we came to a realization that um, oikos um, uh, do have uh, the roots um, in various um, words as we see especially economics ecology and ecumenism and then we saw the ecological crisis unfolding in the global south and we did come to india as well and then what we did was we came um, to a, a quote by uh, see um, by see a song saying that we are somehow carrying business as usual with no viable alternatives and we came to an understanding of ecological injustice if you remember that there is a danger of familiarity um, and uh, yeah thank you dr jotinia for your um, for uh, for your good words uh, so um, we were looking at how our false understanding has created a, a certain sense of immunity uh, to our understanding of climate change and uh, the sense of familiarity which we need to be aware of. Then we saw very quickly the roots of the ecological crisis uh, through, um, uh, through an understanding of eco-theology uh, from various sources. Then we sense that uh, uh, there's an evacuation of divine meaning. That somehow the environmental crisis is not simply economic or technological, it is free, but it is um, certainly moral and spiritual. And that's why our faith affirmation is important as to what our understanding of faith is in terms of an ecological consciousness. And, um, and we ask for a certain shifts to be done, if you remember. The list was evident and then we started uh, suggesting that then we need to decenter our um, our knowledge as to where we get our knowledge from in terms of the ecological crisis do we get from dominant sources or do we get from subversive sources something that we have not heard until now and that's why green movements are important because that is where we sense uh, the voice of the earth the rights of the earth uh, becoming real, becoming uh, becoming literal, that which we can actually sense and participate as allies. And we, uh, we gave ourselves example of certain green movements that are happening around us. Um, and uh, we, we, we need to be part of these movements. Thank you. Thank you once again. So uh, please let let us know if you do have any uh, okay there is a question uh, that uh, we have thank you very much um, uh, Ms. Himalata for that uh, we have a question from uh, Ms. Annie if I might read it um, uh, when we speak about uh, climate justice how do you think environmental justice differs in an upper class neighborhood versus uh, poverty stricken or indigenous area since I feel that uh, this upper class people is the reason why um, uh, they live in polluted areas, um, uh, polluted uh, places or, or peripheral places. That is true. Um, uh, what you are sensing, Ms. Annie, is what is happening around us. I think uh, the way in which you actually um, uh, put this uh, together is what we are sensing. You actually put everything in, in actually a nutshell. And I thank you for this perspective that you actually brought brought us in. Um, uh, green movements um, and, and uh, subsequent question that you have actually asked is this, does this green movement help, uh, help them? Green movement is a justice movement. Green movement is a revelatory movement. It's a point of revelation wherein which we actually sense that this is an injustice that is happening. I, you, you have said that there is uh, the upwardly mobile class is responsible uh, for the ecological crisis that actually that actually strikes at the heart of indigenous communities and uh, green movements how does it help it actually it actually brings forth 
right at the center as to what exactly is the injustice. That's number one. It it um, it unfolds. It unwraps. It uh, it clarifies. It uh, it uh, it actually brings forth into existence what is hidden, the hidden part of the ecological crisis that the dominant are actually perpetuating the ecological crisis. What green movements do is it directly brings to us what is happening and what should happen. So it is not only a critique, it is also an alternative consciousness, an alternative way of coming out of this crisis. If we actually hear, hear these green movements, if we participate in these green movements, if we actually listen to the voices that are coming from these green movements, we may perhaps sense an alternative way of overcoming the crisis that is at hand. That is how it helps. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Zani. And I really appreciate again, I appreciate the way in which actually brought the entire lecture to, uh, to what you have said. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Thomas. I can, I can say to your Reverend Thomas now. Congratulations yeah. on the ordination. Yes, go ahead, yes, Reverend yes, Thomas. Actually, when we speak about this uh, ecological crisis and uh, climate issues, uh, we need development at the same time. Mm. When development is going on, there will be some uh, advantages and some disadvantages. Mm. Yeah. Uh, disadvantages, we are focusing that uh, that is ecological crisis but what about the advantages mm. uh, when we are speaking about the narmada but uh, we are focusing on uh, ecological crisis but at the same time there will be a development also uh, in what way we can take this thank you thank you very much uh, thomas for that question um, uh, this is exactly the debate um, can we avoid development altogether? All that, especially the fact that we're actually using technology right now in order to converse here is uh, certainly an irony, isn't it not? That we are actually saying that uh, we do not need development and then we might, um, we might contradict ourselves. Now, uh, the, the, the problem that it comes is that uh, when we look at the merit part and the demerit part, what we call the advantage, the disadvantage, uh, we need to sense who does it advantage and who does it disadvantage. Who are the ones to be disadvantaged the most? Who are the ones, uh, what are the ones that are disadvantaged the most? Let's take uh, the issue that uh, you have actually raised, very pertinent issue, the NBN, the Narmada Vachavandalun. We, we ask this fundamental question, who stands to benefit from the dam? That's the first question we have to ask. Any project, any development that we sense is the first question that we are to constantly ask, who stands to benefit? And who stands not to benefit? Who becomes disadvantaged for that in the Narmada um, uh, in the Narmada crisis that we see, the advant the, the the most disadvantaged would be the indigenous people, as you know. As much as the dam levels rise, uh, more and more swaths of indigenous lands are taken away, and they are the ones who actually are contributing uh, to this land takeover, but they don't get anything. And the worst thing that has happening is uh, the so-called relocation is the most disastrous of all that we see everywhere across. Relocation is not relocation at all. Uh, there's no compensation at all. Even if there is a compensation, it's not a comp compensation that we can actually sense where the entire life world is taken away and you cannot compensate that. And Ms. Sehmanata has suggested my opinion is that's why sustainable development thought for engineers cannot be avoided altogether. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, 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 the only thing that we are to uh, make this uh, point is that uh, sustainable development is a good concept, no doubt about that. But um, it has actually shielded many of the, uh, the anti-ecological movements that have happened. 
in the name of sustainable development you know it's a it's a fair word it's a safe word it's a safe concept uh, because as soon as we put the word sustainable as an adjective everything is fine everything is fine everything can be justified by simply smuggling the word sustainable um, but we need to see how it actually acts on the ground one more, are, question. One more question yeah thank you uh, is there yeah I, i'm just trying to um, that is ms hemalata's question i would think uh, because of this concept of sustainable development i'm trying to sense that uh, sustainable the very adjective um, can actually can shield uh many of the industries uh um uh, from uh, from accountability actual accountability and that's why they, uh, we always say that there needs to be an ecological audit of sustainable development an ecological audit of anything that claims to be sustainable that claims to be sustainable yeah i think uh, yeah i i suppose that might perhaps uh, uh indicates this in a way uh over to dr koshi thank you achan for explaining everything in a simple and systematic way thank you